Welcome back to Generals and Napoleon, episode 48, Queen Hortense of Holland, stepdaughter of Napoleon and mother of Napoleon III. We have a very special episode today. We're going to talk about uh, Napoleon's stepdaughter, Hortense de Bourgogne, with a very special guest, uh, Beatrice Knight. She's a fantastic author. She has a new book out called Alverstone, and you can learn more about Beatrice on her website, Beatrice Knight, Knight with a K, dot com. Beatrice, how are you? I'm very well, John. Thank you for the opportunity to podcast with you. Yeah. Um, I'm excited to talk about Hortense de Bohane today. Yeah, um, it, me too. And and thank you for the little plug for my new book. Yeah, um, could you could you tell us a bit about that? I want I think my uh, listeners would be interested in it just due to the time period. Sure. Alterstone is set in 1813. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a, a sweeping family saga, uh, love, a love story at the centre, war, adventure. I take my readers on a trip from the ballrooms of London um, to various country estates in Shropshire, Yorkshire, Vista Highlands, and to um, Salamanca, uh, to the Battle of Leipzig, and finally, um, Wellington on the Pyrenees. Wow. So uh, unlike uh, most of the Regency romances, the lighter ones, um, I basically move location in my story. So it's a big, uh, one of my reviewers called it Downton Abbey meets War and Peace. <laughs> and that's actually quite a good description. Okay. Um, so it's a big book. Yeah, um, sounds sweeping. You're going from London to Spain to basically the Pyrenees on the border of France. It sounds really interesting. And, you know, I follow the fortunes of the um, heroes in the story um, from their vantage point, um, as well as my heroine and her family. Mm -hmm. It is very much a family story and uh, a big adventure. And it's part one of a series that I'm planning, a trilogy, and and I want to move in the second book that I'm writing toward Waterloo and then the post-Waterloo politics. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm going to be going, of course, to the Duchess of Richmond's ball right. book two. Right. Um, you know, the Napoleonic era, the Regency era, is such an enormous canvas. It's so rich in opportunities for writers. That's the field I'm also very interested in. So I'm interested in reenactments. I'm interested in all of that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And Alverstone kind of reflects it. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think it's very timely. Your book just came out yesterday, Alverstone, and I recommend my listeners go check it out. Uh, you can find it, like I said, on Beatrice's website, BeatriceKnight.com. Can they get it on Amazon as well, or where else can they? Yes, yeah, so just you can look it up anywhere: Amazon, Google Books, Apple Books. Got it. Yeah. Well, let's dive in. Um, Hortense de Bourgogne was born in April 1783 in Paris. She was the second child to Josephine, future Empress Josephine of Napoleon, but she was married before to this guy named Alexander de Bourgogne. Can you tell us a bit about Hortense's early life? Well, she grew up. Um, in turbulent times, mm -hmm. to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, ultimately, she and her brother, um, Eugène, were very, very tight with their mother as children because their lives were really catastrophic. Mm -hmm. um, she, uh, she was only 11 years old when her father, Alexander, was executed yeah. in 1794. Yeah. And her mother, you know, was in prison. Yep. Um, it was terrifying. Were they all going to be executed? Mm -hmm. She learned, I think, in that time with her brother, they formed this incredibly intense bond, a survivor's bond. And I think it informed her for the rest of her life. She was always a survivor. She found ways, you know, to take those childhood experiences of her father being executed, of seeing massive political change across a very small time frame yeah this is and during the french revolution and the reign of yes, terror yeah swept up in this chaos and also being a child and being powerless to 
do anything uh, to save people around her. So I think that informed her, and it certainly informed her as her life evolved, and her mother, of course, met Napoleon. Right. And I think that's the interesting part here is, you know, it's, it, it's amazing, like, in 1794, like she, like you said, she's almost virtually, her mom's in prison, her dad's been killed. And then just two years later, her mom falls in love with the most powerful man in France at that time, or at least was about to become, uh, Napoleon, who fall in love. You know, how did you, Eugène and Hortense take to their new famous stepfather? Interestingly, I think they were a little reserved at first because of their experiences, but they, I, I think, it formed this very affectionate bond and it seemed that napoleon himself uh, perhaps because he was so crazy about josephine yeah but he he really did go out of his way to be kind to her children and to really um establish a true bond with them and that was a lifetime bond particularly for Hortense she yeah. was incredibly loyal to him yep. she never forgot how good he was to her mm. and she was in desperate need of a father mm -hmm. when he entered her life her father had been killed and that was never a great relationship to begin with yeah. uh, you know her father Alexandra had actually disowned her mm. as a child as a small child then he came around and acknowledged she was his daughter yeah but but it was never a good relationship whereas i think napoleon allowed her to make the most of herself as a young teenage girl and and she really had a marvelous life with him as her father her stepfather i agree and i think eugene as well you know uh, napoleon made him an aide-de-camp and kind of showed him the ropes in the military, which he didn't have to. He could have just said, you know, Eugene, you just stay here in Paris with your mom. But he really took him under his wing. He did. And and Eugene, I think, again, because he and Hortense were so tight, that, that played really well. Mm -hmm. I mean, they both continued that loyalty to Napoleon all the way through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was reading, you know, um, she's classically educated alongside Napoleon's Machiavellian sister, Caroline, you know, at boarding school. And Hortense is described as a pretty girl with golden blonde hair and blue eyes. But there's more to her than that, right? She's she's pretty intelligent. She is. She's not, um, in some regards, she wasn't what you might think of as just a kind of classic intellectual she was clever and she had great instincts mm -hmm. she was often um everyone who met her even as an adult woman always said how amiable she was how you know they would enter a room with her and she would be the center of attention but very gracious about it and warm mm -hmm. and welcoming and i think she learned those skills early she loved her school she loved being in that environment and honestly, Caroline, I think, was jealous of her. Yeah. She, you know, she had a, a sort of step-sibling rivalry going on because really Hortense was much more likable. Yeah. And, and, and Caroline, and Caroline was Caroline, she, yeah, she, not particularly she, likable. No. No, and, and Caroline despised her mother, you know. And, and Absolutely. So, so, yeah. There was no love lost. And as she, as she got through that education... You know, she, of course, as a young woman, she, you know, started to look around her and, I mean, surrounded by handsome aides and everybody in the court of Napoleon, she, she certainly um, had her opportunities to mm. come out in society and fall in love and, you know, yeah, <laughs> we know what happened to that. Yeah, yeah, we'll, 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 we're, we're, getting, we're approaching that, that love story or, or lack of love story, I should say. Um, but she develops a, a passion for fine art and music and eventually composes rousing marching songs for her stepfather's army, like uh, Partant pour Sari. Um, yes. Is she, I, I, she's written a lot of uh, compositions, correct? Like she has a couple that she's, yes. yeah. She, she was um, a notable composer, actually. Um, I, I think had she been... Had, had it been Eugene's compositions, perhaps um, there would have been more fame. Mm -hmm. But uh, she was well known. She composed a number of uh, military style airs. Uh, she also wrote, um, she painted. Mm -hmm. She was 
not just an average painter, she was actually quite good. Mm -hmm. So she developed a, a love of the arts and it enabled her to express things, I think, from this turbulent childhood. So her music is a little bit unusual for a woman yeah. of the time. Yeah. Um, most of her songs were marching songs mm -hmm. and not surprisingly, of course, being Napoleon's stepdaughter, they got played. Yeah, yeah. And I know her mom was a big patron of the arts, so I'm sure she encouraged that. She did. Yeah. Um, Josephine was, I mean, her salons were famous. And of course, um, Whippons had the opportunity to meet a lot of people of that mindset mm. through her mother and her father, who encouraged her. So she flourished. That's a good point. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily and distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So, no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then, you can distribute your podcast on Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. Uh, but returning to the love story aspect of her life, in 1802, she enters an arranged marriage with Louis Napoleon at the behest of her mother and stepfather. Louis is 24 and Hortense was 19 at that time. Was it a happy marriage or what happened here? Well, it didn't exactly get off to a good start. <laughs> uh, she was in love um, with General Gérard Christophe uh, Dura at the aide de camp of Napoleon's, mm -hmm. and uh, she would have, I think, liked to marry him. Mm -hmm. But she was tremendously loyal to Napoleon, and also she was under pressure from Josephine, her mother, not being able to have more children and not being able to have you know, a baby, right. um, uh, wanted to really cement those family bonds. Um, she wanted more than, I guess, more than one arrow in her quiver. Mm -hmm. So she pushed for that marriage. And Napoleon also wanted his family to be bonded. Mm -hmm. um, and he, you know, loved his stepchildren. So I think really that marriage came about, it was an arranged marriage, a political marriage um, with his younger brother. And and he, um, Louis Napoleon didn't mind. I think he was reasonably attracted to her. Mm -hmm. You know, they produced three children. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, I think he was fine with the marriage himself. I mean, I don't think he was madly in love with anyone else that right. she would do. Right. But she was never in love with him. And and they were a very awkward couple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was reading about that. You know, um, four years later, um, Louis appointed King of Holland with Hortense as queen. And, you know, it sounds like every girl's dream. You know, you get to be queen of a country, but Hort Hortense wasn't thrilled about it. What do you think her reluctance was? I think twofold. One, one of course, was that she didn't love him mm -hmm. and they were now going to be dispatched to a newly formed um, monarchy mm -hmm. in a place where the people weren't exactly thrilled mm -hmm. um, to have Napoleon's brother, you know, foisted on them as their king. Right. So the Dutch weren't eager and she was young and inexperienced, but she wasn't stupid. She knew her limitations. Um, she wanted to do the right thing mm -hmm. by Napoleon. Um, I think she felt that her relationship with Louis was on such a weak footing. How would they handle the pressure of this political situation where the Dutch weren't very welcoming? Right. Yeah, you know, obviously, you know, the Dutch were conquered by Napoleon, so basically he's forcing his brother and Hortense upon them, but... She's initially well-received by the Dutch and grew to enjoy her new country. Uh, she visited marketplaces, made large purchases from merchants, which made her very popular. But at the same time, this seemed to annoy Louis, who was trying to get the Dutch to fawn over him. It, it, I mean, it, I, you know, like you said, they had kids together. So obviously there was some 
attraction there, but it sounds like at this point they kind of become estranged. Well, I think of them as, if you think about a Charles and Diana couple, mm. he thought he should have all the attention. Mm -hmm. He was not the most um, winsome of individuals, you know. Um, <laughs> charismatic, not so much. Yeah. He, yeah. he wasn't charismatic. She outshone him. Mm -hmm. And also because of her arts background and her love of the arts and her, she was elegant, she was cultured, very astute. She was talented, you know, played music, artist. She became, I mean, the in effect, an influencer mm -hmm. um, in the New Kingdom. Whereas he was really sidelined. He was basically Hortense's husband. Yeah, um, which, and you're supposed and, to be the king. You're supposed to be number one, and you're not. Yeah. And so he wasn't keen. And one thing she did that really, um, I think, made the Dutch value both of them more is that she really um, pushed the prominence of, of the Dutch in art. And they'd kind of been sidelined a little. So having this revert where she invited artists, she became a, a patron of the arts. The Dutch really liked that. Ultimately, Louis himself became more loyal to Holland. Right. He, he found that he had a role and they did quite a lot of things together politically. Mm -hmm. So they formed... You know, I guess you could say they were allies rather than lovers. In 1807, though, her first son uh, uh, dies kind of tragically, and Hortense throws all of her energy into raising their second son, Charles Louis Napoleon, who becomes quite famous later in life. Do you think Hortense's efforts to raise this second son imbued some sort of brilliant charisma and problem solving into the future Napoleon III? He strikes me as kind of a a clever opportunist and survivor like his mother and uncle. He was very much her son. Um, he, I, I think it was a, a stroke of luck in history that, uh, I mean, it was terrible that, of course, his brother died ultimately, but Louis Napoleon, I think, uh, never lost sight of the sense that France now belonged to his dynasty or his, his stepfather's dynasty. Mm -hmm. And he, I think he never, ever lost sight of that in part because she reared him to become an emperor. That's mm. my view. Yeah. Um, and I think she instilled in him the family loyalty, the loyalty to country, the ethos, and also he became pretty charismatic himself. He did. And I think... That came from her. It certainly didn't come from his father. Yeah, yeah. So you wonder, like, did Hortense kind of pick and choose, like, things she liked from Napoleon and things she didn't like from Louis and kind of integrated those into her son, you know? I think that may well be true. Yeah. Um, and, he, and he was always the beneficiary of her particular style of very astute um, political maneuvering. Mm -hmm. She... She was good at it, and she taught him how to do it. Indeed. Well, moving on in our story, uh, in 1810, Napoleon forces Louis to abdicate the throne of Holland for putting Dutch interests above those of uh, French interests. And this allows Hortense to return to Paris and separate permanently from Louis. It's also around this time that Napoleon divorces you know, Hortense's mother, Josephine, to pursue his quest for an heir. How did Hortense deal with all this upheaval? Well, she took lovers. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that helped. Um, yeah. She had, I think it was a very difficult period. Mm -hmm. um, she she fell in love um, with Charles de Flohol, mm -hmm. who was Talleyrand's natural son. Mm -hmm. um, he was Murat's aide de camp. Um, she rather scandalously got pregnant by him mm -hmm. um, and had a son who became the Duke of Morney. Um, the upheaval, I think, the interesting aspect of that upheaval and I think something that helped her get through it was that really both Napoleon and Josephine were heartbroken by it, mm -hmm. that their letters to each other make it really clear that he did what he felt he had to do for France. He had to try to produce an heir. He had to somehow um, 
form an appropriate alliance with Austria. It was a very complicated situation. He'd been at war for a long time. He wanted to keep Austria in a box. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it was a complex situation, and she she was Hortense was smart enough to understand the politics, even though she was really devastated. And yet, even though he was divorcing Josephine, he maintained his very close bond with Hortense and Eugène. Right. And and they both of them very easily could have done that. They could have been like, all right, well, you're divorcing Josephine. We're done with you. But they didn't. And yes. there's a great quote from Napoleon, and, and it's going to kind of lead into my second question. Uh, the quote is, when you share in the rise of a family, you must also share in its misfortunes, end quote. Why do you think her and her brother, Eugène, were amongst the few who didn't desert the emperor when things started to go really bad in 1813 and 1814? I think they took that very much to heart. Mm. I mean, they had they had had such upheaval in their lives, and they had been through such political turmoil. I think they also, certainly, your taunts. Um, I think perhaps had a sense that these this too shall pass. Mm-hmm. These are her loyalty was absolute. Her mm. loyalty to Napoleon as her father. She. He was her stepfather, but in her life, he was her father mm-hmm. and and both Eugene and her. And I think that trumped everything. Mm-hmm. She was, and she understood also, I think, that her mother continued to have loyalty to him as well. Right. So right. I, I don't think, it, I think it would have been odd for her to take the opposite course. She was also courageous. Mm-hmm. She had been through a lot. And so I think she trusted that perhaps destiny had something else in store. Um, this too shall pass. I mean, one minute Robespierre was in charge and the next minute he was beheaded. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I read something, and I touched on this in an earlier episode, like half of Napoleon's marshals had a, a parent die when they were young. Same thing with British prime ministers. More than half of them had a, parent die when they were you know young children and and not that i can correlate it but they you know they also had to rise through the french revolution the marshals did as did uh hortense and eugene with keeping their heads so maybe like we were talking earlier that survivor instinct you know you, you can get through anything if you can get through that and and you know absolutely and also napoleon i mean think of his character mm-hmm. Uh, you know, she could have faith that if, if anything was going to work out, he would make it happen. Right, right. Uh, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't beaten. Yeah. Uh, he was, he was still fighting. And I think she had faith that something might happen and she wanted it to happen. Uh-huh. And and she was right. Course, yeah. You know, she was right. Yeah. Well, let's, let's get to that. In 1814, Napoleon abdicates the throne as you said he was still fighting but his marshal said enough so they kind of forced him to abdicate the throne and he was exiled to elba and a month later tragically josephine dies at malmaison how did i mean that must have been talk about a bad two months for hortense that must have been awful Man, a double whammy in every possible way mm-hmm. and she was having a terribly hard time um you know her husband you know louis was they were at odds. Um, mm. She actually became embroiled in a court case over custody of their children. Mm. Um, so it was a very torrid time and the loss of her mother, which, you know, I mean, that that was a curious thing too. During, during that period, um, she had gotten to know Sir Alexander mm-hmm. and she completely charmed him. Mm-hmm. He was... He really wanted to take care of her. So she had the ability, even through this turbulent time, she had a very powerful ally and she had made an ally of him. Mm-hmm. Josephine had done the same. Mm-hmm. She she tried to make an ally of him and really um, her death was in part caused by her catching cold, wanting to show Tsar Alexander her roses by moonlight. Yeah. Um, she wasn't well. But she went out in her flimsy garments and was charming him at, mm. by by moonlight and essentially caught pneumonia and died from it. Awful, awful, yeah. And but 
you know, Hortense, you know, she gets through that, of course. And Napoleon escapes Elba in 1815 and makes his triumphant return to Paris. And Hortense is one of the few to greet him at the Tuileries Palace. Her mother has died. Yeah, Eugene is, isn't there. He's with his uh, father-in-law, I think, in um, Germany. So why do you think Hortense is there? What You know, she doesn't have to be there. No, she didn't, although, as luck would have it, the court case she was embroiled in, the very day he returned, they rendered their decision. Mm. So she, in part, almost had to be there for that. But also, I think, you know, she she was waiting for something to happen. I don't know if she caught wind of it, mm -hmm. but I think she had some sense that there were a lot of wheels in motion mm -hmm. and she she was in i mean she was there anyway mm -hmm. um but of course she was one of those people to greet him he the people were happy to see him mm -hmm. um and she said when when she greeted him she said i had a, pre a a presentiment that you would return and i waited for you here that's amazing absolutely amazing so she had a real feeling about it yeah um and even though, you know, her life was in turmoil and a lot of people advised her to leave. Yeah. She flatly refused. No. Yeah, uh, she, she's a very courageous woman. So after Waterloo, uh, which, you know, you'll talk about in your second book, uh, King Louis XVIII reclaims the throne and banishes Hortense along basically with all the Bonapartes from France. Yes. What does she do in her later years? I know she travels a bit uh, in Europe. Well, she devoted a lot of her energies to raising her sons. So she had the two boys, mm -hmm. um, Louis Napoleon and, and his brother, mm -hmm. Napoleon Louis. I mean, yeah. <laughs> why would you call them that? Right. But, uh, right. <laughs> I guess she, she uh, had her reasons. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but she never let them forget that they were, in her eyes, um, the legitimate heirs of Napoleon. Mm -hmm. um, she was very focused on their political futures and she reared them accordingly. She brought them up. She also wrote her memoirs in those years. Mm -hmm. So um, those are some interesting memoirs to read. Um, she got to work on them. Um, she maintained contact with Louis, and, you know, her ex-husband, and they sort of came to terms about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, she also developed important friendships. And I, I think one of the most important friendships um, she developed was with Madame Recamier, mm -hmm. who um, was, a, you know, a, a famous uh, mover and shaker politically, right. a woman who, you know, was mistress of famous people. Yeah. And she was a, a remarkable character. She really kept um, Hortense plugged into French politics. Right. She had a lot of connections. They, yeah. Yes. She was very connected. They exchanged a lot of letters. Mm -hmm. And so Hortense, you know, she was in Switzerland. She was in different places. She really created um, a, a salon of its era. She was, you know, it was full of political people, artists, intellectuals. She set up her own, in effect, a sort of court away from court. Mm -hmm. And um, she, I think in those years... Really, most of her goal was thinking about what she could possibly do to get her son really um, back to France. Mm -hmm. I think that was a focus of hers. Yeah, I know she worked with a lot of charities. You know, she's a very courteous woman, uh, wanting to make, you know, and it just shows what kind of person she is. Very much so. And mm -hmm. she, you know, she had this life where anybody with any real influence in Europe, she probably met them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she had all sorts of levers that she could pull. And, um, you know, she she really, I think, thought ultimately that the restoration would not continue, mm -hmm. um, that the Bourbon restoration would end. Mm -hmm. And I think she had a strong feeling about it because in part I think she had her finger on the pulse of the French people. Yeah, yeah, and she... She was, you know, all her connections. She was proven to be right. Unfortunately, though, she doesn't get to see her son, you know, claim that top spot, which would have been probably a really amazing thing for her. She, oh, uh, I know, it's a shame. 
1837, she dies of cancer at the age of 54 and is buried next to her mother. What do you think her legacy is? And, and clearly a part of that must be Napoleon III, who ruled France longer than his more famous uncle. But what do you think? I, mean, I guess you could answer that in two parts. Like what is Hortense's legacy? And then I guess her son, Napoleon III, carrying on her legacy, I guess. Yes, I, I think her son was was her legacy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like to think that she, you know, she must have, if she if she could see from heaven, she would have seen just what really how well France did under him. Mm-hmm. That he he became he he really put down strong foundations. Mm-hmm. He had many years of peace in France. Mm-hmm. He. You know, the country started having risen from the ashes of the revolution, having had this rather appalling restoration attempt that didn't work well for the people. Finally, they actually had, in effect, peace, power and harmony Mm -hmm. under her son. And so he was her legacy. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, I think of her legacy as setting a standard for women and girls Mm -hmm. of the era to take a more political view to see her as a role model, and many did. Mm -hmm. Um, And in history, I think she's underrated. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Very few people would have survived what she had survived and would still have been able to wield political power. I mean, she really was an interesting person. She She was truly an influencer. And looking back at her as a woman in history, I, I think of her as really an extraordinary role model. Yeah, um, to to have it, to have nothing. Royalty. Yeah, to have like almost nothing when you're 11 years old, then to become queen of a country not long after that, then to lose it all again, then to build up your son enough where he gets to become king of a country. I mean, it's almost it's almost a book if you don't mind me saying. Well, it kind of is a book, and I have thought about writing it, and others have written, you know, about Hortense, but it, I, I would really like, she's going to appear in my second book. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, a number of historical characters actually do appear in cameos um, in my in my book, All the Stone. Mm-hmm. You know, I have a number of historical figures just kind of passing through the story. Right. You know, Sir Charles Stewart, of course, Wellington, mm-hmm. different people, and... And in book two, she, the Duchess of Richmond, Lady Blessington, I mean, all of these people are going to have little cameos and, of course, Hortense. Yeah. Um, the, the, so, you know, the, it's a good opportunity for me because the timing's completely perfect. Yeah, and, and, I, uh, and I think they're larger-than-life characters. And it's against her story. And, yeah. And, you know, depict her as a role model. Mm. Um, so <laughs> that's, uh, I, I would love to write a much longer um, book on her, but that's probably several books away for me. Yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe that'll be your 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 nonfiction entry. You know that you know you'll do a couple of fictions and then do do a nonfiction on Hortense or something like um, that. I, you know, if I were going to do one on anyone, it would be her. Yeah. So yeah. that's yeah. Uh, that's you know I have a very strong interest in her life. Yeah. Um, and thank you for giving me the chance to talk about her. Oh yeah, you, you did fantastic, and I I learned a lot, and I, hopefully my listeners did as well. She was. An intriguing woman, and you know, I think an integral part of Napoleon's empire. Very much so, yeah. and I think he viewed her that way too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, treat, um, and treated her as such, which is more, you know even more important. So, you know, a high compliment. She earned. She wanted to earn her stepfather's loyalty, approval, and love, and she did so. Agreed. Agreed. Well, Beatrice, thank you so much. Again, the website for Beatrice is Beatrice Knight. Uh, dot com. If you want to learn more about her or her books, check it out. And thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate it, John. You have a a great day. And uh, thank you to your listeners for tuning in.